Hello again everyone, welcome back to p -Tech Chemistry channel. My name is Dr. On. In this tutorial video, I'll continue this uh, list of practical experiments stated in the Cambridge International 9701. This is A-level chemistry, paper 3 component practical is an AS-level component. This is the syllabus from 2022 onwards. So in my previous tutorials, I've gone through this quantitative analysis on titrations, which involve acid-based titrations, as well as redox titrations. In this particular video, I'll go through this rates of reaction experiment. So candidates are expected to be able to follow instructions. So very important, follow instructions. And this instruction can be long instructions or short instructions. Candidates must be able to read as well as in a, you know, annotate on the question paper, the order in which they mix things and stuff, and then record the time. So you need a stopwatch. So you need a stopwatch, otherwise you cannot record the time. And these are digital stopwatch usually. So, you know, make sure you know how to use a digital stopwatch as you would have uh, used, you know, in the school laboratory setting. And this is for an observation to occur. And that is essentially the disappearing cross experiment. So you would put a, you mix the solution together in a conical flask. And this conical flask is on top of this piece of paper, which could be provided by Cambridge or in the school experiment. We just provide the students with just a big cross at the bottom here. And then as this reaction produce a precipitate, and this precipitate is a solid, and that cross will be obscured. And you can find out this particular uh, video in my rate of reaction topic and it was actually part of what I did for the GCSE or the all level or the IGCSE level chemistry on the rate of reaction. Now there could also be other than this thiosulfan acid reaction, there could also be a popular iodine clock reaction where when you mix things together and then either the either the solution mixture went from blue black in the presence of starch, your iodine will give you blue black solution and it will go colorless, or it could be the other way around where your colorless solution in the presence of starch suddenly become blue black. Uh, you know, that's partly because of iodine clock reaction. It's like it happens over over a period of time that you know you stop your stopwatch when you see that observable change to occur. So for this disappearing cross experiment, I just randomly look at some question papers and they were also based on what my students had done previously in A levels. So this was the November uh, 2012 paper 33. So you have these disappearing cross precipitation of sulfur. You also have November 2017 paper 34 for similar kind of uh, practical, but the questions we did are slightly different. Of course, it's not just doing the practical. That's usually the easy bit. It's also the tabulation of result, the analysis of result which include error analysis, improvement, and that kind of things. With this iodine clot reaction, there was one particular practical that my students previously did. It was the November 2015 paper 36. So without further ado, let us just go through a couple of questions. So this is 3.1a in my level. So what is this one? This one is winter 2012. That means October, November 2012 paper 33 you are to investigate how the rate of reactions, so how fast the reaction is going, but this is technically defined in the theory. It's defined as change in amount. How much is the amount of a substance changing per unit time? So we are looking at change in amount over change in time. And this change in amount could be the mass of the reactants, where you would expect the mass of reactants to decrease over time. So, you know, this could be a mass, or it could be volume of gas, and then this is time, and then you'll be looking at this graph where the gradient of this graph will tell you the change in amount of a change in time, and there's essentially rate of reaction, something from all level, IGCSE or GCSE level chemistry, when you did rate of reactions as a 14 to 16 years old chemistry student. Now you have this sodium thiosulfate in the new paper 3 AS syllabus, you are expected to know the formula of thiosulfate ion, because you are supposed to test for thiosulfate ion. Have a look in the syllabus paper, sorry, not the syllabus paper, but the 2022 sample paper three. You will see that at the back of the two pages result, thiosulfate ions are indicated as one of the ions stated in the table for the cations and the anions to be tested for. It will give you a white precipitate, which in any case, it actually looks more like pale yellow precipitate in the presence of an acid. And that's essentially what you're doing here. You're trying to produce the sulfur precipitate, which will obscure the cross underneath the conical flask there. So thiosulfate reacting with acid will give you this solid precipitate. And this precipitate will mean that your solution is no longer 
is no longer you know like clear solution instead you get something that will obscure uh, the, the the print or the cross that's why we call this the disappearing cross but I think in a real exam they will give you like a piece of paper provided by Cambridge and with some letters written underneath and obviously this print the words will disappear due to the suspension of sulfur precipitating out there so you are given this particular concentration of a solution and solution as usual read through any instructions and you will use varying volumes of FA1 so that is what you are changing FA1 is your sodium thiosulfate so this is what you are changing so what you are changing really is the concentration of Na2SO3 this is to change what you change in the experiment this is as stated under fair testing in primary school sciences what you are changing that is called your independent variable so you change independent variable and what are you measuring you are measuring the time taken for the sulfur precipitate to form so this is what you measure time taken for the print or the cross to disappear completely to disappear or if you read the instruction above the objective was to find out the rate of reactions and your indication was when the print is no longer visible after you mix the solution together and from there you can get the rate of reaction because rate is related to the time taken for the print to disappear so what you are measuring is not the rate what you are measuring is the time taken so when you're asked on what is the thing that you're measuring it is actually the time taken and this is called the dependent variable dependent variable is what you measure in an experiment and to measure time you definitely need something called a stopwatch usually a digital stopwatch to be honest you're changing the concentration of sodium thiosulfate but you have another solution which is hcl but you keep the same volume of hcl so this one constant volume of hcl so you're not changing the concentration of hcl so if the concentration of hcl is not changing it's not changing because when you change the concentration of the other reactant reactant concentration reactant concentration the head acid gives you the h plus there reactant concentration can affect collision frequency and as you change concentration of the reactant it can affect the rate of reaction which will affect the time taken for the cross to disappear you don't want that because what are you investigating you're investigating what happened to the rate of reaction as you change the concentration of sodium thiosulfate so this is as the concentration of sodium thiosulfate is changed so it all depends on your objective what is your objective and this is the reason why we always 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 try to think about our experiment before we just jump on and do it and because these are not changing this is what you call control variable rate of reaction question together with paper 5 experimental planning and design they like to ask you what you are measuring what you are changing what you you know what you are measuring and what you keep constant of course this is why in paper 5 the exam report always say students have problem doing paper 5 because they've never done the actual practical or rather they have done it but they don't really understand what they are talking about independent variable is what you change what you measure is called dependent variable and then what you don't change but could affect the factors uh, that could affect the result of what you are measuring that is called control variable now what you wanted was to do with the rate but you don't measure rate you calculate the rate you calculate the rate and rate is proportional sorry inversely proportional to the time taken which is why in this particular experiment one you use a measuring cylinder to transfer this much fa1 which was your thiosulfate into the beaker and then you put in 20 cm cube fa2 which is your hydrochloric acid uh, so you have 50 plus 20 cm cube you stir them together you see this question here stir the contents of the beaker once so if they say once i've seen students doing this experiment and they stir it multiple times so you know your supervisor will be doing the actual practical so follow the instruction it was stated in the syllabus just now candidates should be able to read the instruction if you stir more than once you're going to affect the rate in terms of how often the particles collide and therefore your result might be different from your supervisor and this all will result in accuracy marks there so you stop timing when the printed material is just no longer visible now this is the difficult thing because you know how would you know what your supervisor would do but follow the question it said just no longer visible just no longer visible so it become opaque opaque 
is a property stated in primary school science. It means that you cannot see through anymore. But then, even though I had done red is inversely proportional to one over time, what do the question want you to do? They want you to calculate because you calculate the rate and then you calculate the value of 1000 over reaction time to three significant figures. If you don't follow the instruction, you are not going to get any marks at all. So what you get is uh, the time taken and this is in second and this is time taken. Well, you need the time taken and then you have 1000 over the reaction time and this is in second minus one because it's something divided by the time and I should probably record my result very carefully. This is to do with the volume of FA2 and then this is to do with the volume of FA1. So in any experiment, you try to come up with your heading, what you are putting in and the units are very important and of course the data analysis, the last bit there must be three significant figures. So you follow your result there and this volume are from measuring cylinder. So measuring cylinder is not the most accurate thing in the world. So do not use, do not use two decimal place because these are measuring cylinder. So you will just measure to the nearest whole number. And I'm just putting in the value because that is what the question has already instructed us. 50 cm cube and this is 20 cm cube. I do not have to put in cm cube because I already leveled on my header there. Of course, then you put in your actual result and then process it 1000 over time. And you were asked to empty, rinse and dry the beaker. So, you know, drying the beaker there. So you do not need it to be extremely dry, but you should get a piece of tissue paper from whoever is supervising the exam to just wipe the inside dry. Now what you have is you have 40 cm cube or FA1. This is your Na2, S2 or 3. Remember, this is what we are changing. We are changing the concentration of the Na2, S2 or 3. Just now we use 50 cm cube. Now we have to add in, we have to top up. So this is called topping up. And what you're doing here, what you're doing here is using distilled water because this is pure and this one has no dissolved ions. Your tap water contains other dissolved ions which can affect the result of the experiment. What you're doing here is you are diluting. You are diluting the original stock solution of Na2S2O3. This is called serial dilution. I cover this when I talk about paper three, sorry, paper five, and this is also included in the, in the experimental tutorial playlist, which you can browse around and have a look at that. Basically, what you are going to have is you're going to have similar kind of table here, but but we will have volume, volume of FA1 in cm cube. We will also have volume of distilled water because we are going to change the amount of FA1 and distilled water. And then we will have volume of FA2. The other thing that we don't change, this is to keep constant because this is your control variable. And then you'll be measuring time in seconds with your stopwatch. But do not forget, you also need something else. You need to convert this into rate by doing 1000 over reaction time. And this has to be to three significant figures. So this is 1000 over time and this will be in per second, and this has to be in three significant figures. So, you know, I have just outlined my table that I need to record my result. In my first experiment previously, I would have 50 cm cube of FA1 and nothing, none of the distilled water added. And I think I added, how much just now? 50 and 20, so I don't need the table here really. Perhaps I need my table here. When you have completed all the experiment one to five, carry out one further experiment using a different volume of FA1 and distilled water. So altogether, you will have six experiments. So I had 20 CNQ or FA2 just now and 50 CNQ FA1 without any distilled water, without any distilled water. So in my experiment two, in my experiment two, I got to read the information, 40 CNQ FA1 and 10 CNQ of distilled water. So 40 cm cube FA1 and 10 cm cube distilled water. I do not change my FA2 because FA2 is the HCl. I keep it constant as that is my control variable. You do not change the control variable because you're interested in what happened to the rate as you change the concentration of FA1, which is the sodium thiosulfate. What is your objective? Always think back on your objective. Do not just randomly change things as you wish. Experiment three, 30 cm cube FA1. 
20 cm of distilled water. So really, we are doing 30 and then 20 and then 10. So 30 and then 20 and then 10. So that's experiment 3, 4 and 5. So I do not change my volume of FA2. And then this volume has to be added up to the same total volume as all I'm doing is serial dilution. Serial dilution means as I change the volume of FA1, then you know I, I also change the volume of distilled water so that the total volume remains the same. I have lesser of the concentrated stuff and more distilled water. So essentially I am diluting like a syrup solution. I am making it less and less concentrated. So going this way, more water and lesser of this, it becomes less concentrated. And all of these will lead to a reaction because FA1 can you know, react with FA2 to give you the time taken for the sulfur precipitate to disappear. The last bit is called decision making. Experiment 6 is to do with another experiment, another experiment, a different volume of FA1 and distilled water. So that means a lot of students, they would think, oh, 50, 40, 30, 20, and 10, they would think 0 and 50. But if you do 0 and 50 as your sixth experiment, then you just have distilled water, distilled water and acid. They will just make the acid dilute, but there is no thiosulfate, so your time will be infinite because there's no reaction. There's literally no reaction without any thiosulfate. So this is a very bad choice. Do not go and do something like that, okay? Because you will not get any reaction. So 5 is sensible. Then you need 45. You also need 20 CQ FA2. You can get the time. You can get the 1 over time. Sorry, 1000 over time to 3 significant figures. When you have completed experiment 1 to 5, carry out. So you have to do it. You have to do it. If you had done 0 and 50 then, you can wait forever for your paper tree and you will never finish the paper tree practical because there will be no reaction if you don't have any FA1 at all. Hopefully that makes sense there, yeah? Of course, record your result for all the experiments. So experiment number I did, volume of FA1, volume of distilled water. Do not forget the units. The units are very important as stated in the syllabus, of course. Reaction time, 1000 over reaction time. They wanted you to record your result here. I have recorded my result there. I think you should follow the question and record it there. There are quite a lot of marks here. A few marks are for doing experiment. I think at least one of the marks is for the three significant figures as instructed by the question earlier. One marks for the units and one mark for the correct decision making and a couple more marks for the accuracy because they ask you to stir once. If you didn't follow the instruction and you stir more than once, your reaction could be faster as you are making the particles collide more frequently and as a result, your result might be different from your supervisor or your teacher who actually stirred once and followed the instruction. So, you know, that could result in loss of marks on accuracy. So be very, very careful there. Of course, you are supposed to draw a graph, so start each axis at zero because, you know, as you have rate against the volume of FA1, so when you have x equal to zero, so that means no FA1. If no FA1, therefore no reaction. Remember, FA1 is a thiosulfate. sulfate. If no reaction, rate will be zero. So you got to have and think, you got to think about what happened when the x-axis is zero. The line of best fit. So I'll just go straight onto one of my previous students' results. Uh, where is it? I think this was one of my previous student results. So I did circle a couple of things that the student missed out on. Um, but overall, this student was all right. I think this is a slightly different question, actually. Can't see the graph here. Mm, can't see the graph here. Must be the other ones. Uh, where's the other one then? Okay, I can't, I can't see the graph there. But anyway, you get my point. You're supposed to draw a graph. And graph itself is worth five marks here. Why is it five marks? Well, one mark for the label. So the x-axis, what is the x-axis? And then the unit, so those are levels. What are the y-axis and the unit? Okay, and then the scale. Scale is very important. How big are you going to make each of these division? You can see this is a slightly thicker line. In paper five, planning paper, one of the questions will be on graph as, as well. But they have reduced the mark in paper five because they expect you to be able to, you know, come up with a scale in paper three. And that's why they give you the scale in paper five so you can focus on putting in the value. Then plotting. Plotting in the value, sometimes students make a mistake with those. So, you know, those will give you some free marks in paper three. There will always be questions on analysis. These are to do with the data and thinking about experiments, thinking about uh, you know the errors, uh, thinking about the percentage uncertainty, etc., etc., and stuff. For example, this is uncertainty. Uncertainty is to do with the percentage error. This is to do with the stopwatch. This is to do with time. 
So when you use stopwatch, you do not do initial time or final time. We do not do that. We just press our stopwatch from zero, zero. We only do it once. We collected it once. If we only do it once, when you gotten your time, you do not multiply the uncertainty by, by two because you only did it once to get your final time there. If you recorded reaction time, I don't have the actual value, but let me just make up a value. So we know that as we go up in the experiment number, we make it more dilute just now. We make the cell surface more dilute, so it will become longer time, it becomes slower. But what I'm saying is these are made up number, these are random number, these are not actual experiment numbers. But how are we going to calculate the percentage uncertainty here? We do not need to multiply this uncertainty by 2 because time is not something that you have to do final minus initial. So what we get is plus minus 2 divided by 60 times 100% and this will be roughly a value there. And this value, 2 divided by 60 times 100, I get 3.333 on my calculator. I should really give it to two significant figures as I could imagine this being two sig fig, this being one sig fig. One or two significant figures for my final answer would, be, would have been okay. Three sig fig, probably too many already because I don't have anything three significant figure from the data that I'm using. The next one, the uncertainty is eight. I do not need to multiply by two because again, time is not something that I need to collect twice, I just collect once. Again, to two significant figure, this is going to give me 4.4%. Hopefully that makes sense there. Blah, 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 what do we need now? Uh, complete the heading is to record the volume of FA1, volume of distilled water, volume of FA2. What do we want here? I don't know what do we want here. Uh, oh yeah, okay. Now, you want to change concentration of acid. If you want to change concentration of acid, so that means you this is to change. So this is now your dependent, sorry, independent variable because your 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 acid is now changing. So this is your independent variable. So your independent variable is what you change, which will be the concentration of acid in this experiment seven and eight. So you want to copy the volumes used in experiment three. So we are following our previous result. Experiment three just now was to do with 30 CNQ FA1, 20 CNQ FA2, of course, top it out with 20 CNQ distilled water. So 30 CNQ FA1, 30 CNQ FA1, where is it? Uh, volume of FA1, don't forget the unit. And then this was 30. Don't forget we have to change the volume of water just now, the distilled water earlier. So we top it up to 50 cn cube, right? So 30 plus 20 give me 50 cn cube. And now the very important one now is your volume of your acid, which is Fa2. This is also in cm cube. It was 20 cm cube, I believe, just now. Um, very bad memory. I need to have a look. So experiment 3, 30, 20, 20. And now remember, what does the question want you to do? To change the concentration of acid to change the concentration of acid. So therefore, I must keep this one constant. Must keep the thiosol fat constant. Must keep the volume of FA1 constant. Why? Because this is a new set of experiment. This is now your control variable because your objective has changed. Your new objective is to find out how the rate changes as you change the concentration of the acid. So as I change the concentration of acid, then I will mix these two together first before I you know, mix them into FA1. So these two will be mixed together and the V total must be the same. Okay, so they have to add up to the same V total. If I change the volume of FA2, I can change it to 15, I can change it to 10. So 20 plus 20 is 40. So 15 plus something must be equal to 40. So I need to get uh, 40 minus 15, which is 25 cm cube. 40 minus 10, which is 30 cn cube. You can do other possibilities as long as the total volume add up to 40 and also as long as this is not zero because when you don't have any acid, there will be no reaction with the thiosulfate. sulfate, there will be no sulfur precipitation, you will be waiting forever for a reaction that will never happen. Hopefully that makes sense there, yeah? Anyway, I should probably, you know, speed up a little bit. There's a second sort of experiment. The second one is to do with the iodine clock reaction. So iodine clock reactions is basically this type of thing. I call it iodine clock, but they might call it differently. So here the iron 3 reacts with iodide to give you iron 2 and it produces iodine aqueous. 
Iodine Aqueous Solution is a brown solution. It's not blue-black because without any starch, it will not be blue-black. Without any starch, it will not be blue-black. So this is brown solution and it's aqueous solution. This is your thiosulfate. Thiosulfate and iodine redox titrations are very, very, very popular. So these are colorless solution. So you're expecting something colorless there, but to help you to see the color changes very, very easily, you're going to use something called a starch indicator, which means the brown solution in the presence of starch will turn blue-black only because, only because, you know, uh, starch is pre present. So only because of that, you are going to get blue-black coloration. Without any starch, you're going to remain brown. This is not a redox titration question. This is a rate of reaction question. So you're going to start timing when you mix them together and you're going to stop timing when the browns, when the blue-black solution suddenly turn colorless. That means no more iodine. I believe that is what you're doing because this is what you're doing. The mixture turns brown. That is to do with the I2 aqueous being produced and then uh, it will turn a blue-black color as you have the starch indicator. So in the presence of starch, in the presence of starch, it will go blue-black. And then stop timing when this blue-black color appears. So this blue-black color appears when I2 get produced. When I2 is produced, then you know you stop timing. And this I2 is produced when I guess when this reaction produces iodide and then the iodide reacts with that and it produces the I2 again, so it will give you the blue black coloration in the presence of starch. So I think, I think this is actually the first reaction, this is the second reaction. There's a lot of chemicals here. I have a feeling that uh, if I remember correctly, that this was one that required a lot of steps, a lot of measuring cylinders like you know small measuring cylinders so measuring cylinders are not the most accurate apparatus in the world but imagine when you're doing this in pepper tree practical if you have to use burette for each of them you're gonna be using up a lot more time in exam that's why we use measuring cylinder okay for the convenience but there are some stuff you use a burette you see you fill a burette with fb1 so this is more accurate as we know burette accuracy plus minus 0 0.5 cnq per single reading but because every single volume that you measure out, if you want to run 20.00 CN cube, you will have the final volume, which will be like 20.00, but you will have started from an initial volume of 0 0.00, then your titer, how much you allow it to pass out will be 20.00 CN cube. So you needed two readings to get this 20.00. So what is the percentage error in your uh, titer? How do you measure the percentage error or percentage uncertainty in measuring this 20.00? Well, it will be something divided by the 20.00 CNQ. The uncertainty in one burette reading is 0 0.05 CNQ, but you needed two. You need two readings because final minus initial for a burette reading. That's why we multiply the error in a single reading by two. And this is typical for any titration experiment involving the burette and we are measuring our 20.00 cn cube so our uncertainty or percentage error in the burette reading is 0.5 percent there okay so you want to stop timing when this disappears you want to record to the nearest second and you're going to wash both beakers and repeat the experiment what you're doing here really is you're changing the volume of fb1 use and then you are changing the amount of distilled water use and then you're measuring the time taken to the nearest second. So this is whole number, whole number. And as usual in a red uh, experiment, you're gonna have a series of experiments, one until six. And the objective, if you read the objective, this is to do with the rate of reactions. And this is to do with, what are we doing here actually? So we have 20 CNQ FB1. So FB1 is FeCl3. And we have 10 CNQ FB1 and 10 cnq distilled water. So what we're doing is we are changing, we are changing the concentration of FB1, which is your iron, iron three chloride there. So there is Fe3 plus. That is what we are changing. What we are changing in an experiment, this is called your independent variable. You change independent variable in an experiment, and then what are you measuring? You are measuring the time taken for the blue-black color to disappear. What do we measure? We don't measure rate, we measure the time taken with a stopwatch, the time taken for the blue-black color. This is to do with the presence of iodine, 
but the question tell us the time taken for the blue black color to appear not to disappear so this is your dependent variable this is what you measure what you measure is called dependent variable they can ask you one mark question state the independent variable state the dependent variable what are you keeping constant what are you keeping constant to keep constant or to be constant or not changing so there are certain things that can affect your rate of reactions but you must keep them constant they are called control variable control variables factors that could affect your readings which are the time taken for the blue black color to appear those will be the concentration of the other reactant because fb1 is your iron 3 plus so we want to change the concentration of iron 3 plus we don't want the s2 or 3 2 minus to change okay uh, we don't want the i minus to change as well so fb2 there 10 cm cube fb3 there 20 cm cube fb2 there 10 cm cube fb2 10 cm cube so you see no change in the fb2 no change in the fb3 so what are you keeping constant you're keeping the constant volume of fb2 and the volume of fb3 because they could affect the rate of your experiment as the fb2 was iodide changing the concentration of the reacting particles can affect collision frequency s2 or 3 2 minus changing the concentration of the reactant can affect the collision frequency and they can affect the rate of this reaction they can affect the time taken for that blue black color to appear you're supposed to you know like these students uh, volume of distilled water use level with a unit volume of fb1 use level with a unit time uh, in second but then that's because that's what they want you to do for further experiments so altogether six experiments total volume must be kept constant so you are doing serial dilution if you change the volume total volume then you won't be able to do direct proportion of your of your concentration you know when you have more water but you have lesser fb1 so your fb1 concentration will decrease by a certain factor when you keep the volume of fb2 and volume of fb3 constant because those things they don't ask you to include in a table because those are your control variable if they want they could have asked you to include in a table like what we did in the previous question to show that they are not changing and only this particular concentration of fb1 is changing okay so this student has lost some marks because burette reading has to be taken to two decimal place we measure out the volume of fb1 using burette reading you see the volume of fb1 that is less than 6.00 cm cube because burette reading read up to two decimal place and in all your instruction you fill the burette with distilled water you also fill the burette with fb1 this is another burette so all of these they are using burette so all of that are using burette burette reading must be given to two decimal place there so i think this video has gone long enough but there will always be some calculation question so this student has done very well in the calculations well with the ball ratio for the balance equation uh with the with the results you know from the experiment etc etc and then there will always be a graph question usually related to rate and there are four marks so so this student has drawn a graph paper but obviously in a real exam your your, your graph should be written or drawn inside the graph paper itself yeah okay so this student has put in all the points and you know i think this student hasn't really followed the instruction because what happened when x x is equal to zero when volume of fb1 equal to zero cm cube so the scale there 5 and then 10 and then 15 and 20 so this is a good scale the graph covers more than half of the page this is a good graph the y-axis scale 0 10 20 30 and that is evenly distributed so there's nothing wrong with the scale there is level of the heading with the unit okay there's level of the heading with the unit so that's all right but this bit is not very well done because what happened when your x-axis is zero when the volume of fb1 is zero you have no reactant well one of the reactant is missing when you have no reactant there's no reaction when there is no reaction how can there be any rate so like the previous question that specify you should start from zero zero but always think about what happened when your x-axis is zero this is part of your job as a science student as a scientist we always think about what happened when the x-axis is zero whether it makes sense or not and then you can think about 
joining in your other values. This is anomalous, you know, sometimes an experiment stuff like this happen. So to ensure that this is not a one off, you will repeat this experiment so that you can be certain whether it was your mistake or whether it is something worth investigating further and there's something that interests science uh, in fact it, it, it is what makes science very interesting for a lot of science students okay um, a lot of other students uh, should find this kind of question tricky because this is all about you know what is wrong and how else can you improve your experiment that kind of thing all right so i'll leave you to investigate and to play around with these a bit more i talk about all the important stuff which is to do with the actual uh, practical content itself so hopefully that will be useful to you and don't forget to click the button on the bottom right to subscribe to my channel so i've talked all about rate of reaction experiment so do subscribe to my channel follow me at ptet.chemistry there's a ptet.chemistry on instagram facebook twitter and telegram to get connected i'll see you in the next tutorial video where i'll continue on gravimetric experiments thermometric as well as gas collection experiment thank you for watching